America is built vulnerable and God love us for it. That's yeah. what, that's the point. And so to be upset about our vulnerabilities is a weird way to think about it. We're, we're, we're great. And the, you know, the, the last point you, you made about our oceans make us safer, th that is true. Um, but also what makes us safer, at least from Europe and Turkey and Africa and you know the Middle East and everywhere else is um, you know our capacity to um, integrate and assimilate and welcome the other um, and the other whether it's the Irish here or Mexicans in California or Muslims in Detroit and you know one of the reasons why I've been so um, uh, vocal against this idea. Uh, that you're more safe and secure if you close borders is that's actually the kind of alienation that has uh, led to radicalization in Europe and stuff. I think we're in for a very interesting conversation tonight with Juliet Kayam, um, a very important conversation. Uh, we were talking earlier about how um, security, uh, personal security, national security, and obviously global security, um, it has become such a bigger factor in all of our lives, and it kind of informs uh, levels of comfort, and it challenges, in a lot of ways, our confidence in institutions, and, and in a lot of senses, it almost makes us question ourself. Before we start this interview, I just want to say, you know, um, time and time again, you come into the studio, and I'm kind of a nervous Nelly. I'm in a panic. I think, oh my God, the sky is falling. I'm like chicken little. I'm a nervous wreck, whatever it is. And Juliet comes in and with all these facts and this terrific perspective and, and puts me at ease yeah. and our listeners at ease. So I hope she can put you at ease tonight if you're concerned about, uh, yeah. about these terrible security issues all around the world. So one last thing, the reason that's so important is if you are parents or your grandparents or your aunts and uncles, you got to tell all this to the kids, uh, right? How to deal with these things for your children. So we're going to start talking about the book Security Mom. Uh, we're going to talk about security moms in politics. And we're going to um, end with a little bit about how Juliet managed to pull all this off <laughs> with three kids. And then we'll leave time at the end for yeah. questions. So let's start with what is a security mom? Oh, okay. Well, can I just start? Is Phil still here and Marjorie? I don't know if Phil may have left and Marjorie. Um, it can't be said enough how awesome uh, WGBH is. So uh, I want to thank you. We're, I'm hitting two-year anniversary. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, you're, you're, I'm a contributor. Uh, and so, but um, my husband heard me say to someone, I, I have, you know, sort of a portfolio lifestyle, run a company, I'm teaching CNN and stuff. And I said, but WGBH is the best half hour of my week. And he goes, Thanks, you know. I mean, like, you know, that date night is, you know, you know, fourth place. Uh, but uh, so I want to thank you both, and I should just a shout out to Sarah Burns and the Burns family. Sarah is my agent, um, and the entire Burns family is just uh, remarkable. So I want to. Uh, she came in from New York and actually uh, knew that there was a story here uh, in. Um, my life in uh, Homeland Security and as a mother of three, I didn't know what the story was. So anyone who has a good agent and friend who helps you get the story out. So the security mom is actually a demographic that grew out of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and it was both an electoral demographic as well as a uh, sort of commercial demographic, uh, you know, sort of a, a advertising demographic. It described women mostly white. Um, a suburban woman who had uh, children who were much more nervous about the world around them, especially after 9-11. Now, I'm not a sociologist, so I'm not going to get into why were women feeling this different than men, but it was a uh, quantifiable group of women um, who uh, were uh, responsible essentially for the uh, sort of Republican groundswell in the 2002 election and were likely responsible uh, for uh, the re-election of President Bush. Uh, they abandoned the Democratic Party or if they were independents they tended to vote for Bush in the re-election. So there's this thing and it's the notion of her is so pathetic, right? It is this idea that she's um, so defenseless, doesn't know what to do, needs the big man to save her, you know, needs to, uh, you know, is hiding, you know, under her table and stuff. And I, you know, I hate it, one, because of my profession, but also because I'm a mother of three. Like, that's not the people I know, right? Um, 
But so I sort of use the term to sort of say, you know, look, actually, um, uh, security moms are most of the moms I know, and security dads and security aunts and uncles. It's people who uh, want to feel empowered about the world around them and the mayhem around them, uh, but actually don't know how. So the book is quite critical of my profession. Um, and uh, set, you know, I say at the beginning of the book, we managed to talk to the American public in a way that either made them tune out or freak out. And so the hope of the book is to find that sort of middle ground. Um, and so that's what I do uh, in the book. OK, so, t so tell us a little bit. Because you, know, you, you talk in the book about how people come up to you all the time after some disaster yeah. and say, are we safe? Right. And what do you say when people say? I don't use are we safe. I, so I say no. Um, and <laughs> Because it's such a bad way to think about the world we live in. And, and I think that's the amnesia that I describe after 9-11 was like, it wasn't like 9-10 was, you know, unicorns and fairy tales. I mean, obviously it was a very disruptive moment for our country. Um, but, uh, you know, now that we're hitting 15 years, you know, you, when you think about what our country has experienced over, uh, you know, uh, two world wars and a civil war and, and um, various conflicts, uh, uh, we need to put it in perspective. Uh, and so I talk about are we safer, right? That that's government's obligation, it's also our obligation to ourselves. That how do we minimize risk to ourselves and our communities, um, one home at a time, one community at a time? So I, when I say, you know, and I, I find answering your question no really liberating and in fact empowering. Like, it's of, of course we're not. And that's a great thing, right? Because our vulnerabilities are because of how, um, accessible we are as a nation, um, how uh, the flow of people and goods and ideas that make us uh, such an open society. And, and for parents in the room, you know, I do, uh, I do say in the book, you know, if you believe, as I do, that it's your God-given right to get on Amazon.com and order forgotten baseball pants that you forgot to get and the game is in 24 hours, and you expect it to arrive, as I do, uh, just think of the level of vulnerabilities in that, right? I mean, in a society in which you would, you know, just to, the, the, the cyber, the, the commercial aspects, the flow, the, um, and that's a good thing. OK, we haven't had, in the last few days anyway, yeah. any uh, terror issues, yeah. in, at least in the United States of America. So, but we do have things all the time mm -hmm. in the news. I was mentioning to you before, we had this terrible situation, awesome. I'm sure you read about it, in Taunton, yeah. where you had uh, something that's very scary to people, a random attack where a person that obviously had some mental health issues goes into the home of two strangers, didn't even know them, attacks both these women, drives through the Macy's at the mall there, uh, at the Galleria, whatever it is, the Galleria Silver or Silver Gallery or whatever it is, in Taunton, drives into the Macy's, attacks people there, goes to Petrucci's, attacks people there, two, uh, three are dead, and, and several people had knife injuries. So your children hear this on the news. Um, what do you tell them? So, uh, you know, in this instance and in most instances, you just have to put it in risk perspective for them, right? That And that random bad things do happen. I mean, and I think uh, you're not going to hide them from Maybe it depends on what age they are. But uh, your kids, you know, I mean, I don't know when people generally get iPhones. I mean, I do know because my kids generally get them at 8 and 9. We live in Cambridge, so they have a much an urban lifestyle. Um, and so they know. I mean, the idea that I'm gonna, you know, they've, it's getting, you know, they're getting it just thrown in their faces. If they're on Instagram, they're getting it, right? And so, um, and so part of the job of adults, it's not just parents, but part of the job of adults is to steer those concerns into both, you know, putting it in perspective, accepting that their bad things do happen, and then finally, engaging them in you know, preparedness, resiliency. And that's the piece that we tend to forget. And that's part of the, of the message of this, is that if, um, if security, security tends to involve, in, in my world, you know, sort of three facets. It's to minimize risk, ma maximize our defenses, and maintain our spirit, which we can get into with, with Donald Trump. And, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and we have to do all three. And one way to do that with your family or to do it for yourself is, OK, assuming a world in which bad things will happen, which we know to be true, right? So this idea of never again and we're going to prevent all bad things from happening is, you know, it's, it's a fiction, as I say. And, and so if you assume bad things are going to happen, what would you want to do? The most important thing in a disaster, as I describe, um, and lessons I learned from Hurricane Katrina, um, is family unification. 
And it's the simplest thing in the world. It is the one thing that all of you, if there is, you know, it doesn't have to be terrorism. If there's a disruption to your system, uh, to the system, um, what would you wish you had spent five minutes doing? And it's just talking to your kids about what family unification looks like. It's the only thing you're going to care about. Um, once you're with your kids or your spouse or you, you know that your parents, your elderly parents are okay or your sister or brother, um, uh, then that's that's grip, right? That is actually resiliency. And so I talk about you know how to communicate that and talk about family unification and what schools' obligations are and things like that. I, I should say you know just bringing it close to home. People um, uh, uh, talk about the Boston Marathon, and we tend to describe it as Boston Strong, which you learn in the book. I can't stand. I mean, you know, I'll never run for office again because I'm going to say this. I can't stand Boston Strong because it gives people a sense that we got through that and that our success was measured because of some mood that we had or our Irish stock or, you know. And the truth is, is um, there are a number of things that we invested in. Um, as Homeland Security head, I was uh, uh, part of the team that oversaw the Boston Marathon years before the attacks. Uh, we invested in training. We invested in the capacity to, to uh, pivot so that the public health was able to, to pivot and save lives. Um, but also, something that's not mentioned, and I study disasters, I mean, that's who I am, is um, the family unification of the 10,000 additional runners that were still uh, coming across the finish line, that the decision, based on training, of the Boston police to move everyone from Boylston Street two blocks, not one block, one block's too close, two blocks to Commonwealth Avenue um, and focus on getting runners, a lot of them who don't have iPhones, with their family members so that the area was essentially vacated within two hours. Now that's grip, right? Because if you're with your family, you're fine, right? I mean, a disruption has happened, but so thinking about ways that, that we can do that. So I, it, that's it, a long answer, sorry. But. That's, no, that's okay. When you talked about family unification, say that there's a, a hurricane or yeah. whatever it is, what does that mean? We're all going to meet back at, the at house 3 or, Elm Street? Yeah, or we're or all... and like, I don't mean to be like, kids aren't that, sm I mean, you know, my name, it's my kids, but like the basics of, uh, you know, what would it mean to walk? So if, and this depends on like, if you're in the suburbs, it's gonna be very different. I can't answer the right questions. But in my case, all my kids walk to school. So if they're in between, if they're at school, the school's gonna have something. But if they're in Harvard Square, or two of them are at baseball practice right now, what would it mean to, to get home? How should they get home? What are places in between that mm -hmm. there are sort of safe places? Because you have to assume also that um, cell service will be disrupted, as it was on the Boston Marathon. It'd just be disrupted for a little bit. Just little things, your kids, First of all, they're going to get it. I mean, they get, you know, they get wearing helmets and seatbelts and stuff. Um, and it's, as I say, it's empowering. It's much better than yelling at the TV saying, you know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, which I think is your philosophy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it is. I panic and fall apart right, and become no, hysterical. It's not. It's actually not a good philosophy. You know, yeah, if you're not. sitting around just being like, you know, either conspiracy theorists, right? Like this is all BS, which it's not. At least it's not for kids. You, mm -hmm. you know, if you, whatever your politics are, and I, I talk about this. I have a chapter in the book um, about um, trying to get my kids' daycare engaged with uh, preparedness and the reaction. Very, I live in a very liberal. Well, I live in Cambridge, which like, is, uh, I was going to say very liberal part of Cambridge. I'm like, okay, and that would distinguish it from, um, uh, you know, uh, um, and so the, uh, and, and the pushback I got by people who viewed Homeland Security as, you know, the Bush conspiracy and torture and Abu Ghraib and Gu Guantanamo. And I, you know, and I'm saying it's your kids. You can have whatever political philosophy you want, you know, outside of your kids, but for purposes of your obligation to um, each other. Um, and I should say, uh, you know, get prepared. And I should say for, you know, make some speculation of WGBH listeners. I mean, one of the reasons why people like us should engage in preparedness is why you're doing it is because you, we need to relieve limited public safety resources for those who don't have the resources that we do. Um, and so if everyone's calling 911, it's, it, that's, that's a disaster. Now, remember in the Bush administration after 9-11, yeah. the motto was make a kit, yeah. make a plan. So should we make a kit, make a plan? Yeah, you should get your ass prepared. So I, you know, I talk about it when, when you, uh, uh, where the books are, because I know you all are going to buy the books. There's actually, we had, Simon & Schuster uh, did a, a nice bookmark that um, uh, has some, 
uh, uh, handy hints. I think we made it too hard for you all, and then, and then therefore everyone just like walked away. You know, it was like IKEA furniture. It's like it's too hard. I'm you know I'm going with the made stuff. You know, and so um, and so I just talk about it as a very simple uh, step. So it's it's uh, and the most important is the one I just talked about, which is communication. If you don't have anything in your house, but you've talked to your kids, that's going to get you far. Because the truth is. Disruptions are generally limited in time, and they could be, you know, they can be coming from Mother Nature, from yeah. the generator breaking down, whatever. Um, I think I just read in Seattle it was a squirrel that like caused like a thirty thousand. You know, I mean these things happen. Um, as I say in the book, stuff happens. Um, and then um, uh, uh, the second piece, I'm going to get to the provisions last. The second piece is uh, paperwork, which I know that sounds really odd, but. Um, if you have to restart, and just think worst case scenario, but think about it with a smile, um, and it won't be less scary. Um, and so, you know, the worst case scenario is you just have to rebuild identity, which is a hard thing to do. So I always tell people, take a picture of, you know, your passport, birth certificate, social security cards, put them in the cloud, or uh, Xerox them, and, you know, like, most people Xerox them and then put them next to the original. That sort of defeats <laughs> the purpose. You know, mail them out of state. You know, and maybe because I grew up in California, this was all part of earthquake planning. And then the third is um, home is where, um, in most instances, you will be safest. That's not always true. There's evacuations and things like that. So um, emergency oh, wow. managers talk in terms of 72 on you. That's a long time, I know. That's 72 hours. And that tends to be Florida, California, just... You know, if you wanted to think about sort of what would I want for a couple of days if I were just sort of stuck here, um, that's a lot. I recognize that, so I sort of just say, well, if you could just start with the day, and that's it's really simple. I mean, it's 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 water, it's protein bars, it's nuts, it's things that are, and then the list is out there. You know, things that are uh, particular to you and your family. So if there's special medications, if kids are still in diapers. Um, uh, or formula. Pets, really important. Don't forget about the pets. People do really stupid stuff for their pets. Um, don't do stupid stuff for your pets, but they do do it. So if you can think that like through. What? They like, you know, don't evacuate. They like go oh. into f like houses on fire, you know, and then it's always the person who dies. The dog gets out fine. I mean, let me just tell you, Fido is going to be just fine. Um, uh, and if not, at least you will be. So the people do um, uh, crazy things, and and, uh, and um, you know, and then things that might just make you comfortable. I mean, I say in that you know, I you know, we're we're a, we're a vodka and red vines family. So you know, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> and cash, you're telling and me cash. cash. Oh, I'm sorry. And then the four, right, the other thing is cash. Yeah. Um, we uh, live in a. We're, we're becoming a non-currency. Uh, world, uh, but currency still matters. And so if you can, just have a, you know, $200, I have $200, $300 in my house. Um, that's, that, you know what, and I'll tell you something, that's just for me, right? I mean, in other words, um, if you, what I tell, I don't fight people's irrationality, I try to guide it. Like, I'm not gonna, you know, if you guys are worried about things and whatever, for me, mine is, I don't want to be without cash. For whatever reason, I don't. Um, and um, and it's just important to have, you know, whether it's because you need to run out quickly or um, electricity is down and, and you can't use credit cards. So it's just things to, to steer, you know, you know, talking a little politically, I think, and I worked for him, so I love him, um, and think he's been an incredibly successful president, but I do think that since San Bernardino, Paris, and Belgium, um, uh, I think the administration has been a little bit flat-footed in recognizing people's concern. You see it in the polling. It's, it's not cable news's fault. It's, it's actually people are nervous that they're going to go to a concert one day, and they're, you know, or their kid will, even worse. And so I think the more that we can guide that, you know, irrationality is a harsh way to put it, but you know, that low-risk scenario, um, the more. Uh, prepared will be and the less nervous we will be. That's the other thing, to be well, less nervous. We've talked about this in the radio, but I, I have wondered whether, you know, the land of the free and the home of the brave is a little bit irrationally over the top nervous about terrorism. I mean, the, you, you know, Turkey, you know, Israel, all these countries, obviously the, the terrible wars that are going on in, in Syria and Iraq and the, what people deal with in Baghdad. Yeah. You know, we have been remarkably lucky here in the United States um, mostly because of our geography, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's geography, and there's a couple other things. I mean, people in Homeland Security, so if you actually want to know what Homeland Security is, because I do think, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people, 
you know, your interaction with Homeland Security is TSA. That's not a good, uh, and it, I mean, trust me, it won't be this summer. Um, uh, they're expecting, and uh, you've been probably reading it, but they're, because oil prices are down, people are flying more, which is, you know, because airlines are cheaper. So uh, get there early um, and don't complain to the TSA agents. But most of our interaction is with TSA. So actually the book is also descriptive. It just sort of says, what is Homeland Security? What are its different pieces? What are its priorities? Just to give, you know, it's the second largest federal agency agency and people you know don't actually um, understand it and, and what I describe in it is in Homeland Security now we we don't talk in terms of um, terrorism I mean one because it is such a low risk though it's a different kind of risk because it's a purposeful you know the fact that someone purposefully wants to harm is different than a hurricane or a you know a, a Zika or whatever else but we do talk in terms of all hazards now which is that society has to be prepared for any number of hazards. You can't define, you know, they're infinite. I can make you nervous for a long period of time. They're, they're infinite, right? It's cyber, or Zika, whatever. And, um, uh, and, uh, and so instead of thinking, what am I gonna do for Zika versus what am I gonna do for this or that or that, you think, okay, the world has a level of risk and hazard, and about 80% of, of uh, responses will always be the same. Right, I mean, obviously I can, you know, oh, nuclear will be different, of course it will be different, but the truth is, is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, training and preparedness and community engagement and, uh, and uh, you know, having stuff in your home. All, all of it is, is essentially the same, whatever the harm is, um, though terrorism does, it is different because it is purposeful, but we're, we're not at, you know, I've said on air, and it's my favorite statistic is, right, you're more likely to die from a, uh, uh, a selfie stick, um, taking a selfie with a stick, because people are like going to really crazy places uh, and being like, look at me at the Grand Canyon. And right over the side. Right. Look at me ignoring that law. Yeah, it's very right. embarrassing. <laughs> very embarrassing way look to go. Look at me on I this think. cliff that says, don't leave. <laughs> um, sorry. But yes, that you are more like, so be careful of that too. But nonetheless. So all hazards is the way to think about it. Don't, don't think about, oh, it's all hazards. And we, you know, the point book is America is built vulnerable and God love us for it. That's yeah. what, that's the point. And so to be upset about our vulnerabilities is a weird way to think about it. We're, we're, we're great. And the, you know, the, the last point you, you made about our oceans make us safer, th that is true. Um, but also what makes us safer, at least from Europe and Turkey and Africa and, you know, the Middle East and everywhere else is, um, you know, our capacity to um, integrate and assimilate and welcome the other. Um, and the other, whether it's the Irish here or Mexicans in California or Muslims in Detroit. And, you know, one of the reasons why I've been so um, uh, vocal against this idea uh, that you're more safe and secure if you close borders is that's actually the kind of alienation that has uh, led to radicalization in Europe and stuff. I think my necklace is hitting. Let me take it off. Wardrobe change. Oh, okay. I didn't know is what that, that was. Is that me? Yeah, there might, we go. might be you. Well, let me ask you though about about you mentioned you know Brussels and and Paris and these places where we've had these terrible terrible attacks, people fearing going to theaters and so forth. So, what do you tell? Um, there were a lot of stories after the attack in the Brussels airport or before that in the theater in Paris about kids yeah. that are overseas spending the year abroad or this summer when you're going to go travel. Do you go? Do yes. you go to Brussels? Do you yeah. go to Belgium? Yeah, you I do. mean you do. I mean you do only because I mean for a variety of reasons. I remind people, it's not like there's going to be a white flag hanging over Europe anytime soon that says, okay, now it's safe. I mean we're at a we're at at a moment in our in in world history in which there's a certain kind of threat. Um, it's random, it's unknowable, and that's probably gonna be true for some time. So, so when you say you're not gonna go this summer, I was like, and then you'll go when? Like, I mean, in other words, I, you can't guarantee. So, so what I say is the State Department is um, pretty good, and I mean, this is, you know, tactical advice, but go online, sign up. Um, they'll know that you're in country. Uh, the things I say with kids is um, I, do get uh, uh, cell service for the kids' phones, although they're not allowed to use it, but just in case that they were somewhere, you know, you just want to have communication. But some of the most important things are things like, do your kids know where you're staying? I realize this when we travel a lot with the kids abroad, you know, they'd be like, we're at the hotel. 
<laughs> and that's my fault, you know? I mean, it's like the, all the hotels to them look the same, right? You know, they have a pool and room service. That's like, okay, they're at the hotel. So, or if you, a lot of people travel now with Airbnb, you know, is, um, uh, you know, do, do they know where they are? they physically are, do they, you know, and then, you know, phone numbers that you could put in your phone, and, 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 you know, the equivalent of 911 and stuff. So that's just the things you just, as I say, you just try to lower the risk, knowing that the risk will never be zero, but a absolutely in terms of uh, uh, travel. And the kids overseas and the overseas program, no problem with that. Yeah, no, I mean, just, yeah, okay. no, I mean, not no problem. <laughs> I, <laughs> have I taught you nothing? I mean, um, I mean that I that the I just when you ask, as I was like the, the alternative is, you know, is then your kids won't experience the world that will become a more insular society, which I think over the long term becomes uh, scarier for the United okay. States. Uh, and so, but you know, there are precautions that you can take, and obviously, you know, yes, obviously, you know, don't you know, you know, don't. Don't wear a you know, you know Trump is awesome shirt you know, <laughs> you know in London where the mayor is now Muslim, which tells you where yeah. we are um, as compared to other nations. Well, I want to talk about Donald Trump in just a second and about politics. Please do. And, but before we get to that, you know, and I've asked you this a lot in the radio. You mentioned the TSA, and every yeah. year, you people probably know there's some story. I forget who the reporter is. Maybe it's from ABC that sees we can get through TSA, and he gets through these huge bazookas, and he gets through you know, these long Bowie knives and all this kind of stuff, and you think, this is really great. They're really doing a great job, which leads you to believe that maybe they're a little bit incompetent. Yeah. But we have a much larger homeland security structure. We have uh, uh, you know, the Secret Service. We have all the, the CIA, all these. I mean. Do we generally know what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the TSA is not a little example of the bigger. Yeah. So, um, so what I describe in the book is why does you know it you know why does it look so bad? So part of it is I have to say a lot of those stories were um, you you don't see those stories as often now. So I mean, part of it is technology has made things easier. So the tension in security. Um, uh, is security is stopping you from getting from point A to point B. So the more security you put on, the more delay you're going to have. So, like, you know, every year a reporter will say, I brought, you know, a bomb, you know, a fake bomb onto the red line. And I said, so the alternative is all of you go through metal detectors before you get on the red line. You can't have a society like that. You can't have an economy like that. So part of it is figuring out how much security you can put on to, to still allow flow. That flow is the tension in security. And that's true of a Boston Marathon. You can have a totally safe Boston Marathon, and that's no marathon, right? Or no spectators, right? And there's, you can have a totally safe Olympics, but um, not here, but you can have a totally <laughs> safe Olympics somewhere by not having the Olympics. Maybe we should host it. And then, um, and so, so those are the, that's the tension. And so way, the way to think about security, and TSA is a perfect example, is, um, is, is that it's layered, right? So, and I, I describe this with the Salahi case. The Salahi was the woman from the Real Housewives of, uh, of, Virgi of Washington, D.C. It's a great story. It's not a great story if you were. <laughs> <laughs> so she got in, you know, she was in a salon for nine hours, and then she got into the state dinner for the Indian prime minister, which is like not, it's, it, it shouldn't have happened. She looked the part. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of tension about flow. This was exactly it. It was flow. It was the first state dinner under a new administration. And so you have very fancy people who want to get in to see the uh, prime minister and the president. And so there was that tension between flow and security. So when we looked back, and so I tell these stories in this way, right? And so uh, just so people understand. So when we look back, because you have to learn from your mistakes rather than, you know, just, you know, killing yourself all the time over them. We look back, it, it turned out that um, the system of security was built around uh, what, what we call a single point, or had a single point of failure. In other words, you don't want a system that has a single point of failure. Uh, uh, because if that thing goes down, which it did in this case, where she, when, she got, when she got through one place, the rest, even though it was security, was never going to stop her because her identity had been assumed by that stage. So, so then you think, well, how can I build a system of security that's layered so that at any given moment, so that you can have flow, but at any given moment, you're, you're trying to weed out. So at the moment you're at the TSA line, um, so much has happened already. I mean, you will know this, and you know, there's, you know, when you don't have 
an expectation of privacy when you take an airplane flight. So we know a lot about you, a lot about your travel plans, who you're traveling with. We know how you paid. We know where you've been. We know if you went to Turkey and then you didn't. We didn't. We didn't know where you were for three months. And so part of that. Uh, process is a layered security, and there's also randomness in it. So the 80-year-old white woman is going to get pulled over because that day, uh, you know, the randomness order to the TSA agents was, you know, 1, 7, 9, 14, 2, 6. You know, that's your pulling out people. You just have to put randomness into the system. So part of this is just trying to explain, you know, why is that 80-year-old woman being pulled over? It's not because the TSA agent is an idiot. It is because you put randomness into the system in the hopes, as part of a layer defense, um, that uh, that the randomness will pick something up. But um, so that's sort of how that works. I think once again, technology will change the way we even consider TSA. I think within five years, there's going to be two classes of travelers. There are going to be the smart travelers, the global entry travelers, and the not so smart travelers, uh, which is uh, so. I urge you all to stand in line and get it. Which are the ones who have to wait through the long line, and that will be the world that we live in. Is the is is when I say smart, that's the system. It's called the smart system, um, of the global entry. You know, in a few minutes, we're going to take some questions, but a few more things I want to touch on before we do. Um, we talked about this day in the radio, too, that, of course, there was elections, as people know. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, uh, even though not officially yet, but it's certainly looking that way. And there was a Quinnipiac poll yeah. today that talked about the swing states, which are, of course, crucial in the election, Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And according to this poll, and they're pretty good at Quinnipiac, Trump uh, is viewed as better than Hillary Clinton on terrorism. In Florida, 49-43. In Ohio, 48-43. In Pennsylvania, they're about even. So if there is a yeah. terrorist attack, yeah. uh, even if it's uh, the so-called lone wolf thing close to the election, your October surprise. Your October right surprise. Yeah. What's your analysis, Ms. Um, I think we're in, I, I mean, so if you listen to me on the radio, I'm like, you know, people say you're so paranoid. I, I, I'd rather be a paranoid winning Democrat than a, you know, losing one. And uh, um, I'm not, uh, how do I put this? I think the Trump phenomenon is uh, like nothing we've ever encountered before, and we better take it pretty seriously. Because if you ask me, could I see him putting together the weirdest base, right, of supporters um, uh, to win? The answer is yes. And it, part of it is, you know, look, it's premature. These polling premature. You, once Obama starts campaigning, and you know, people actually start getting out there, it, it will change. But um, uh, and I'm a you know, the, I'm a, an unapologetic Hillary Clinton fan, so I mean, I, everyone's like, I, I like her. You know, I actually like her, and so, um, uh, and so, thank you. Um, I, I, I realized I was going to stop apologizing about it, um, but so the, um, the, the challenge and what you're seeing Trump do, and this is, you know, what I've been warning Democrats about, because I, I brief a lot of um, uh, Democrats um, uh, uh, who are in government, uh, and have rules still at the department is uh, that the um, the women vote, which we might assume is going to so predominantly go to Hillary Clinton, this, this gap, the gender gap, the woman's card gap, um, actually closes if the question is, you know, who will be better at terrorism. That that's where these numbers are flipping. Is that white women, the security moms, are actually doing it? So. We are living in a time right now in which terrorism is ranking seven or eight. Um, that wasn't true after San Bernardino and Paris and Brussels. That was it was ranked one or two, and that's when you actually saw, uh, uh, you know, the sort of um, uh, rise of discussions about the sec security mom. So if there is an incident, or if the campaign is allowed to be driven by uh, terrorism. Um, uh, I personally think we we can't rely on either the woman vote or, you know, whatever vote, you know, and and so that's what makes me nervous. And he's got to be looking at these numbers too and go, well, well, that's a good number for me. And why is that happening? That's happening because women on that question are switching votes. For a lot of us in this room, you can't understand it. I get it, but it's true. And unless we, unless those who find Trump not only unqualified but actually just, um, just. Uh, um, uh, not a, a le legitimate 
uh, uh, person to represent the United States, and also who will make us less safe in the future, um, we, we just have to look at those numbers. It's making me nervous. And you spoke today, too, like about the idea that if the, the point of groups like ISIS is to have this holy war between, the, uh, you know, between yeah. them and the infidels, so-called, that it's not inconceivable that someone could plan something. Yeah because that would help Trump to, win. Listen, like this is like where, you know, say it with a smile because it is kind of scary. Like no security apparatus, Donald Trump's or Obama's or Clinton's or, who, or Bush's, no security apparatus um, is going to stop a 22-year-old kid who converts to Islam because most of the Americans uh, who are uh, try ISIS attacks are converts. They are not raised. Um, who converts, has easy access to weapons, because that's the country we live in, and, uh, and, and finds a soft target. There, like, there's no security apparatus. And it, you know, I love it when people are to be like, we have to be more like Israel. And I kind of like, that's working? Like, I don't, I mean, no, I mean it honestly. Like, there's no security apparatus that is going to be able to stop that. And that's the worry. It doesn't even have to be organized. It just has to be someone who, is, who, who does it um, uh, in the name of uh, terrorism or ISIS, um, that might be the October surprise. You know, last night, when last night happened, you know, I'm one of these people who watches TV and just goes, God, please no. I mean, in the sense that if that had been some ISIS guy that had been being tracked by the FBI, you know, all of we the can taunt debate, thing, you mean. the taunt thing, yeah. we can debate whether it's right or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that's occurring, but um, in terms of the definition, but that would have been viewed very, that would be a national story. It was below the fold in Boston, which I thought was, in the Boston Globe, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I think because it, it happened so late. Yeah, well, they had that awful story about the fire chief from the oh, top, yeah, too. Right. That the fire mm -hmm. chief, who didn't see that, that turned out he's alleged to have set uh, fires, fires right. himself. Right. Um, but but uh, uh, one thing I wanted to touch on. As I say, stuff happens. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I wanted to touch on, you know, one of the great things about Juliet's book is you get her, her, her life story of going through school and her family having immigrated here and, and the romance with your husband and how you wound up in these very unusual jobs for a woman. But you also talk about something that I've thought about and a lot of people have thought about, how you balance um, your work, which is pretty intense and pretty time consuming, with having three children. You admit that you uh, missed Leo's seventh birthday. You missed a Christmas celebration. Largely absent from family life, you actually wrote that in one section talking about how your kids are with your in-laws or your parents. I was a guilt-ridden uh, yeah. a, a mother, tremendously guilt-ridden. Guilt and you tell a great story about uh, how one of your kids lost his crock yes, between the yeah. kitchen and the front door. Tell that story, please. Then you okay. can tell us how you dealt with and your I guilt. Should say, I should say, you know, I'm not... Um, I find the, you know, the whole having it all kind of, I don't, like, whatever. And so I don't, I mean, I just sort of think, like, I don't know how to answer these questions that life has unfolded for me in ways that you would not have predicted at 22. Um, I, you know, I, as I say in the book, I followed my husband. I don't even know what that means. I was married. He got a job up here. Um, point out, you did it twice. I did it twice. And a little resentment in the tone no, when you said no, it, too. No, 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 I did it. I did it. J just once. Just, I thought you did it twice. No, moving up here. No, I well, actually was. you know better than a, I do. I was actually, a, I was actually a commuter mom. I lived apart from my kids for seven months. Yeah. And that, that was a lesson in you know you can't be the. Um, we, we devised a rule because I was driving David crazy that the parent in residence is in charge because I would like be like, they have to take. Why are they missing their piano lessons? Because David couldn't really deal with like getting the piano. And then he's like. They suck at piano. Like, let it go. <laughs> it's like you're right. It was like so liberating. Um, they did. You know, it's like um, I think just on that point, and then I'll talk about the croc. Um, partly because I'm around the military a lot in my jobs. You do like that, like cry me a river. I mean, these women are deployed for a year on end, and they have three kids. Like the fact that I'm gonna miss, you know, something. And I think so that put it in perspective. And then the other thing I always tell woman, and I was just born this way, but maybe you can cultivate it, is, is I didn't get the, the, what my husband calls, uh, luckily I did not get the stew gene. Um, STE. I don't stew about stuff, and you see this in the book. I'm like, if I can get 80% of the way there, I'm like really happy. Um, and so, you know, because that last 20% is really hard. And so, you know, so are you like, you know, don't be a perfectionist, don't stew, just do it. And so I do talk about 
these criteria I had as being a mother that I just was constantly breaking, and then I realized it wasn't that I was a bad mother, it was that my criteria was really off. So, you know, if you ever told me, would you miss a kid's birthday? I would say, absolutely not. What kind of mother would I be? If you said, you know, 60,000 gallons of oil are, fall, are in the Gulf of Mexico on a daily basis, and you've been asked by the president to direct the intergovernmental and, and um, uh, uh, interstate response, and, um, and May 28th comes along and oil's hitting shore, would you miss your kid's birthday? I go, oh, if you put it that way, you know, yeah, I missed his birthday. And like, you know, um, I don't think he remembers. Um, and okay, so, that's good. Yeah, so the, so the croc thing is just a story. What I do tell is these stories of doing it and the mistakes you make as a working mother or working parent. Um, the BP oil spill was a major uh, crisis response I had because it was such a mess and the politics and everything. But also, um, we had daily phone calls with the five Republican governors um, that were led out of my office that I was on for 100 plus days straight. Remember, the spill took forever. and. Um, and uh, the five Republican governors, and I say that only because that was part of the political dynamic, was three of those governors were going to run against Obama. It was Perry, Jindal, and Barber. And remember, in 2012, um, uh, three of them hinted. Only Perry got in and actually ended up doing quite well at that stage. So, um, so there was a lot of high politics. And so we're on a call. And I'm trying to balance getting my kids to the swimming pool, because now, now it's summer. I'm back home on a Saturday. There was a pool next door to our house, and I'm on the call. And you know, being tough, you know, assistant secretary and telling them what's going on. And then, you know, then the next person comes on. Maybe it was the National Weather Service or someone like someone technical. And Jeremiah, who is my youngest, who you learn in the book, you know, will will rule the world, but he'll kill me in the process. You know, like he's, you know, we had no energy to discipline him. That's true of many third children. And uh, and. Um, so he loses his crock, those rubbery things, between the kitchen and the front door, because we're all ready to go. And I'm like, I'm like going to take this call while we're, we're walking to the pool, because at this stage, you know, it's like day 97 or whatever. And um, he loses his crock, and he's just like walking out the door with one shoe. And I, you know, say, you know, Jeremiah, what, you know, I, I, I do swear a little bit more than I should. I say, you know, <laughs> where the hell is your crock? And this complete silence with five governors on the line. I've forgotten to press mute. Uh, and their staffs, and then the federal staff, right? So there's, a, there's like, you know, it's 500 people. Complete silence. And I realized I've forgotten to press mute. And I said, hell to my kid. And um, <laughs> Haley Barber, who you learn in the book, is um, a force to reckon with. I don't, um, uh, I really did, uh, re I don't like his politics, but, but respected him. And uh, he just says in his southern drawl, yeah, Jeremiah, what the hell happened to your <laughs> crop? And that was the... That was the, the you know, you know, the, the, you know, how do you do it? Well, actually, you don't, you know, is the right answer. <laughs> okay, um, I'm, supposed so. to, I'm supposed to stop and go open right. for questions Thank now, you. but I just have one quick yes. question before I do. Why did you write this book? Oh, so, um, so, uh, you know, I thought there was a story to tell, as I said, that, and it wasn't, I thought there was a story to tell about um, resiliency and stuff happening and engaging people in their own homeland security that was not being told. Uh, the harder thing was why is memoir. That was the Sarah my agent. You know that was not the easiest part. Like even the title of the book, and you know like um, and there was other versions where I was just you know like this, and and you got all the policy, but you didn't know anything about me. And um, and uh, we had an editor at Simon and Schuster. I remember she read uh, almost complete a draft. I mean, God, uh, you know people people describe books as it was a labor of love. This was not a labor <laughs> of love. And uh, she emails me and she says, uh, this is a memoir, right? You're telling the story of our homeland security from the perspective of uh, you, know, you, right? That that is what it is and what you learned through the process and how you changed and how uh, you managed crises and the similarities between the home and the homeland. So she said, so tell some stories, right? And that was, that was the harder process. But it, part of it was just to get pe people who need to know this stuff you know, and need to engage in their own preparedness and their own resiliency, and they're not going to read a book that says, oh, this is Homeland Security. Maybe they'll read a book uh, that is, you know, a little bit quirky and, you know, humor and, and, um, and just describes a person that hopefully is a lot like all of you. Um, with a well, little, yeah, exactly. <laughs> with a little, you know, twist. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, recently there's been a spate of airline 
uh, passenger disruptions. Yeah. One because of a, a Muslim student who was asked to leave because one woman thought she could well she couldn't distinguish between inshallah and shahid, which I find hard to believe. Right. And two is there was a mathematician who was profiled yeah. because he was writing equations, and her, his fellow passenger got spooked because he was writing some in Arabic. Yeah. So one question is, how do we deal with this level of hysteria, which reminds me of the 1950s yeah. with communism? And two is, with respect about Israel, I do take your point, but in the Israeli airport, they don't have security like we have security here, and why do we have to still dispose of our water and take off our shoes? Yeah. I don't think we really are safe for that way. So, so could you please? Yeah, just, of course. Thank you very and much. that's a great question. So um, Israel has one airport and a population of what? What is it now? Six million. Uh, okay. So guess how many? This is a, such a great number. Just in a twenty-four hour period, domestic airlines. How many people are getting on and off in a twenty-four hour period in the United States? One point four million. Right, it is, and, and you wait an hour and it's like, and, you know, 24 hours, it's another 1.4. So part of it is the clunkiness of it is just like the system is just so much bigger um, that you're, you know, some of it is we, they, we'd rather be over-inclusive than under-inclusive. Now the truth is though, what Israel is, can do is the one-on-one -on -one interview. That you can't, you could not possibly do that in this country and have a commercial airline industry, right? People, you just, you, you know, if I told you you had to get, it's bad enough that I tell you you have to get to the airport one hour before. In Israel, if you have to get there three hours before for a domestic flight, it just, it won't work. And so part of it is just the, the, the level of detail. I totally agree with you on um, these airlines incidents. And so part of this, when I say, you know, in, you know investments in training and, and whatever is, even if, I, even if I forgive, which I don't, the woman who doesn't understand the difference between jihad and in, in, inshallah, you know, um, there is a whole bunch of other people who are making really bad decisions at that moment, right? They're not, they're, they're pulling the guy off. They're telling you know, this person they can't get on. And so part of this is this whole apparatus that is part of the layered defenses, which includes an, you know, an airline uh, uh, hostess or uh, you know, whoever else. Um, uh, also have to be uh, uh, trained right because because there's it, it's it's not that that moment ha has happened unfortunately you know whatever the races are whatever that moment happens a lot it's the bad de eight other bad decisions um, that that uh, empower that that bad interaction that that need to be stopped as well. First, let me applaud the, the context and perspective that you provided in this lecture and in the book. Um, but it, it seems to me that we ought to proceed on the assumption that the October surprise is going to happen. And as, as was touched upon, I think Marjorie touched upon it, there's a, there's a significant incentive on the part of certain people to, to make that happen in order to drive results of the election. So it... it I'm, I'm going to suggest a public service that you could uh, perhaps apply yourself to, uh, since you're, uh, you've got the book out of the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the difficulty, and this this applies to Hillary Clinton too. The difficulty is that the the truth and the you know the analytical bottom line takes paragraphs to express, yeah. but the opposition gets its message out on a ball cap. Right. So I, I'm going to I'm going to and, and I mean that's a very potent force when you think about the bandwidth that's available in the minds of much of the electorate. And whatever, whether we like it or not, it, right. it is what it is. And with all due respect to the majesty of your book, we don't have standing room only for, to get into the, yeah. the, the auditorium tonight. So I'm going to suggest that uh, you, know, you, you work on distilling some sort of a buzz phrase that, frankly, will just about fit on a bumper sticker that will drive people to, to to inquire further right. into this, because once once people take a look at the sort of analysis and perspective that you're presenting, they get it, and I think that that's a big deal. But the, it's getting the leverage to make it happen. Yeah. The, so I mean, it's you know part of this. So as I said, you know, the Democratic Party um, will likely steer from this issue for a variety of reasons. It's, it doesn't motivate the base. Um, it's viewed as a Republican thing um, until the moment that it's, it can't be because something happens. 
Um, and that's just a challenge, right? I mean, that is, you know, this is something that I have been encountering in, in my, you know, I still have government roles and stuff in briefings, is, is the sort of thought that it's out of sight, out of mind. And the, what, what's going to happen is it's not going to be out of sight, out of mind, even if there's not, not an October surprise, there's going to be. And so, you know, that's the, you know, it, there's a, how do you define the progressive homeland security agenda, right? So part of it is stuff happens, right? That's not, that's not going to buy you any votes, right? That the, um, but that, you know, I do think that we, that, that those, and it doesn't even have to be Democrats, but those who worry about where the country might be headed in terms of its response to threats, right? The xenophobia, the building of the walls and stuff, you know, make it absolutely clear um, that uh, fighting this on the safety, that, that we need to get in the face of people like Trump on the safety and security uh, uh, mantle. In other words, I think the tendency of, of people in response to Trump, you know, is, you know, he says no Muslims in the country, right? And then he, he refines it. But you know, he, he makes a, no Muslims in the country, and, he's, and our response, or a lot of the responses often, that's so mean, you know, we don't do that. You know, that's not good, that's not American. And I, we need to get in this face and be like, you, you wanna guarantee a generational uh, a potential for radicalization, you do that, right? Because that is gonna be, and so part of it is getting in the face of safety and security. I don't have, I mean, that's the, but I don't have a good answer to you because um, stuff happens is, you know, maybe a little bit too passive or, I, no, 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 but I mean, it is, no, I've thought about it all the time because it's, yeah, I describe in the book, you know, to be uh, a leader in Homeland Security in the Obama administration, can you imagine? I mean, they're all hope and glory and love it. And then there's like this group of us that come in as like hurricanes and oil spills and terrorists and, you know, it's, it's hard, right? I mean, it is, it's a, so, okay, I'll think about it. I will. <laughs> You see bumper stickers all around, like stuff happens. Clinton, 2016. You know, like that will be it. So, uh, so I'm just gonna continue on this theme. Yeah. Um, so I'm in the terrorism world, but I look at the away game overseas, yeah. and there's a lot of work that's been done on this topic in the last 15 years, and it's pretty clear about what the conditions are politically, economically, and these types of things that feed terrorism and create it, and we don't, like you said, have those conditions here mm. in the US. And so I'm just wondering, you know, that's a really nuanced argument, and that's a difficult case to make, but I think it's also an important part of this narrative. But yeah, I get it. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, and so you come at it from the homeland perspective, right. I come at it from the overseas game, and we give a lot of thought to this, you know, from that perspective, and don't, don't come up with that that bumper sticker, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. So yeah, no, I mean, comment. it is, you know, I try to do the three things, like minimize risk, maximize defenses, maintain our spirit, right? Like I get three M's, I can get it in the three. But it is, it's, it's a super hard uh, narrative um, to do because, uh, you know, it's just, it, and, and the idea that we're gonna stop the next guy in every instance is just, it's, it's Disneyland. It's Disneyland. I read those articles about this summer being bad about traveling yes. as well. So I went on to the global entry, Yay. and I just did it this week. And you have to you sign you do an initial screening, yeah. and then they say schedule an interview. I know. When is it? Well, in Boston, it was the first one was August seventh. Oh they my must God. only do it Saturdays and Sundays. It was August seventh, right. and then and then you and then yeah. I just happen to be flying into Miami International tomorrow night. I. This, I did this Monday morning. Yeah. I could have gotten an appointment in Miami International I know. that day. That's, no, that's what I'm telling people. I don't know what it is about, about Logan, that because I had the same problem. that I sort of had a six-week delay, and then, God forbid, you have a dental appointment or something. You know, like, <laughs> so um, that's what I tell people. I don't, I don't understand it. They know that it's a problem. And so I tell people, if you want it, like, you know, if you have a connection in Charlotte, Charlotte has a really fast process. And even in Miami, you're saying it's no, a day? I got it, like, the, I could have scheduled it within three hours yeah. in yeah. Miami. Yeah. They had it, like, they, they open at 8 and they close at 8 a.m. I don't know if anybody else is. I'm not that sure what you guys She can get the interview. About. So, so global, Sorry. no, no, global <laughs> entry okay. is the sort of like the easy pass for airlines. It's the, oh, okay. it's the one where okay. you don't have to take off your shoes, you don't okay. have to pull out your computer. TSA okay. pre-check, essentially. It has a you know, variety of names. Um, and so basically, you can only get, 
you can only get it if you satisfy a lot of preconditions, and one of them includes uh, in-face fingerprinting and interviewing and stuff. And so if you, if that's a good investment of your own personal resources, if you, especially if you travel a lot, because then you yeah. can uh, okay. not stand in security lines. But um, uh, it is, uh, it, it, for some reason, Logan has a backup. So I tell, yeah. The summer will be over before. Right, <laughs> I know, I know. I, I don't know about the TSA pre, that may be different screening, it may not be. No, it is the same. They're all the same, they all feed into the same thing. Yeah. Get it when you can, I promise you. Yes, you can. That's why, so that if you have a connection in Charlotte or if you're going to Miami, just spend an extra hour, um, and that's what a lot of people are doing, because Boston is... Yes, sir. I Providence. thank you both for coming tonight. Um, I just had a question. We refer back to WikiLeaks yeah. in the effect that whole episode had on Homeland Security is having to this day and perhaps potentially in the future if you could just get your comments on uh, Do you mean uh, uh, WikiLeaks? Snowden. Snowden, Snowden, right, so different, yeah. So, um, oh, I think it's had a tremendous impact. Um, I think uh, for good and for bad. So, you know, people always want you, is he, you know, is he a hero or a villain? I'm like, you know, like life is complex. I mean, the other words, I don't have a bumper sticker for Snowden, right? I mean, I do, you know, um, and so here's the interesting thing. So I think in some ways it, uh, it disclosed as, or it disclosed an uh, intelligence apparatus that uh, was less effective than probably was being sold, to be honest, to the administration. I mean, the fact that, like, you know, it just it was just a lot of information of which it wasn't sure anything actionable was coming out of it. So, in terms of focusing our resources on surveillance, which has to happen, and a lawful surveillance program, which has existed since you know World War I, um, you, what he did had benefits, right, for doing that. Him personally, we can, we can debate. Where I think it's been the most interesting is um, in the public perception of uh, how much authority we want to give government in the fight against terrorism. And I, I draw this from you know, a case study of one. But um, I, I was against the FBI and the FBI Apple. Um, and I think a lot of the national security community was against the FBI and the FBI versus Apple. In fact, one of the reasons why, I, I think the, the administration was shocked that a lot of people from the community were against it. Um, mostly be, for a variety of reasons. But the more interesting thing is the polling on that was 51-49 in favor of Apple. And that was three weeks after San Bernardino. Now, those of us who were around in 9-11 where, you know, the Patriot Act passed 99-0, you know, that was a much more different thing. But I think it does show that, that the public might be getting more sophisticated, both about how, you know, government authority and how much you want to give to it. That polling was shocking to me because you actually had a terrorism incident. It wasn't like a threat. You actually had it. So, but he falls somewhere in between. Hi. I Hi. just want to say it's a pleasure seeing both of you. I, I've listened to you all on the radio for oh, as long as you've been doing the radio, and you're just wonderful. Thank and with you. all due respect to Jim, it's fabulous to have you here without oh. Jim. <laughs> Is he in the room? I don't, I don't, I mean, I, you would see him if he's in the room because he's so tall. But you know, I always joke about when I'm not with Jim, I, I get to talk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you both do, and it's, and it's great. Although, although I, I very much enjoy Jim as well. Oh, he's great. Um, my question was, I just heard a story with regard to the TSA that some airports may are considering doing privatization. Mm. And I wondered if you know anything about that. And then just following up on the situation with regard to Trump and, mm -hmm. and Hillary Clinton, um, I, I was stunned to hear that poll this morning about suburban moms yeah. maybe leaning towards Trump. Um, but I'll say to you, one of the things I hear from my own friends is, well, I don't trust Hillary. Yeah. And I'm, I've been racking my brains as to how to counter that because I, I part of me just wants to say, I don't know why this is, but yeah. how do we counter that? Because it's just so destructive. Right. It is. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, without getting into sort of, you know, the whole politics, I, you know, we have two, cho we're likely to have two choices. There's no like alternative third person that we all, that you know, if you don't like, if you're nervous about Trump and you don't like Hillary, like, you know, the never Trump movement cracks me up. Like, it's like never Trump, but I can't possibly vote for Hillary Clinton. You're like, if you actually think that this would be 
a destructive person to the presidency, which is what makes me nervous about Trump. It isn't, I actually think he's probably like a, you know, a, a, like a, you know, he's a New York Republican, so they don't scare me as much. They're like Massachusetts Republicans. Like, I, I actually think that, like, you know, in terms of his, if we ever found out his policies, that, you know, they're probably um, something. What I worry about is that um, with, with no respect for process and institutions and even laws, that that's, I don't know if we've we've had one president like that, and he got and that was disruptive. Once, you know, and that was very uh, destructive and disruptive to uh, our our country. So that's what makes my, makes me nervous. So you know, trust. Um, you know, that's a that's a. I don't even know how to answer the trust question with Hillary because then you're like, and the alternative is you you trust you know, Trump and um, and. So that's the first thing. On the privatization, I have not heard that. There's always sort of rumors about either the workforce getting privatized so that, uh, and it's an anti-union stance, so I'm against it. You know, it's to undermine the transportation union, unions, which, um, so I think that might be what you're, what you're hearing. There's gonna be a lot of pressure on TSA this summer. Um, I mean, so, you know, this is the, you know, you know, gas prices are down we you know that's a success of this administration but everyone's going to be complaining because it means that your our airline prices are going down and that means that that more people can fly um, so if you want somewhere really cheap go to Brazil during the Olympics <laughs> it's my last advice one thing uh, on the Trump versus the Hillary issue uh, we know that there has not been any details on the Trump side with any of the real hardcore issues that the public may want to know about. But if we are going to support Hillary, the one suggestion I would have, maybe we can uh, pass it up as much as we could, is to, we got to make sure that this is framed as a referendum on Trump, yeah. rather than getting all bogged down into any individual issues that much. It's fine to describe all the issues, but I think we have reached a point where I think the public knows a lot yeah. about uh, this person, and let's just make sure that's a referendum on his yeah. personality and, and tactics, and that's the only thing that will, I think, trump all the other yeah. side issues. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, um, you know, in the world I'm in, in terms of safety and security, um, you know, it, the rhetoric, matters and it matters for um, our you know place in the world and and how people respond to the United States and I think you know people criticize Obama in terms of my, the, my world homeland and national security so they you know he didn't have a doctrine and the truth is he did which was don't do stupid stuff drunk doctrine right and that's not a bad doctrine um, uh, but um, every president has, whatever the doctrine is, Bush, Obama, Clinton, uh, Bush, first Clinton, um, is, uh, ha has a doctrine that makes America relevant. And my biggest fear with Trump isn't the hysteria and the, you know, it is all that. But it's also, I think the world's more dangerous if we're not relevant. We may not send troops or whatever, but we're a, we're a pretty good force in the world, um, no matter how we're engaged. And, um, and you know, diplomacy, uh, human rights, civil rights, um, women's rights, all that stuff. If we become irrelevant, that's, I think, that's destructive, not just to the world, I think, but to us. That's my fear. Well, thank you thank all very you much all. for coming. Most thank appreciated. We have a little reception, I guess, outside. If you can stay for that, that would be great. Thank you. The idea of a wrongful conviction should, um, and I think does, horrify any ethical prosecutor. Uh, and I think there's a risk of wrongful convictions even when we do everything right, even when we do the best we can do, because it's a human system. It's not ever going to be a perfect system.